It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. The message this morning I've titled, Assurance or Deadly Presumption. Assurance or Deadly Presumption. And uh, that's another way of saying, can I know that I'm saved? How do I know if I'm saved? Do I have a right to say I am saved? And where do I stand? Can a Christian have assurance? Understanding whether or not you are in God's will, whether or not you're on the right path, where you stand in God's perspective. Can you tell me something more important than that? Knowing what your eternal status is? I'll tell you, it's a very important subject to study because people live in fear. It's the fear factor that we're talking about. So many folks don't know where they stand with God and I'm talking about people who are believers that have maybe been in the church all their lives but they live in a constant state of apprehension they don't have any element of assurance about the relationship with God and what their status is whether they're saved or not and um, I've equated this to the experience I've observed at the airport many times I've sat in the waiting area before a plane boarded and it's not hard to tell who has confirmed seats and who is on standby. <laughs> Those who have confirmed seats are usually sitting, resting, reading, chatting. Uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, a little bit more ease. And then you can almost always spot those who are on standby. They're doing just that. They are standing by, usually pacing nervously, looking at their watch, huddling around the desk there where the, um, the assistants and the, the flight personnel are, wondering if they're going to get on the plane and, or if they have to wait another day or a few more hours. And there's a great deal of apprehension there. Now, that sort of illustrates where people are often in the relationship with Jesus. A lot of us are sort of on standby. We're just wondering and we're nervous and we're apprehensive and we're pacing and we don't know whether or not we've got a seat. But at the same time, uh, those who have confirmed seats, while they are more relaxed in today's uh, flying, you still wonder if you're going to get there. How far do we go in our relationship with Jesus in knowing how much can we know that we're saved? How presumptuous is it for us to say we're saved? And that's the stuff I want to talk about with you. It's a very important subject. God does not want us to live in a constant state of dread. 1 John 4, 18, a lot of verses. You might look up as many as possible. Have a pencil handy if you want to look at some of the references. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. The Lord, when we have committed our lives to Him, He wants to save us from this constant fear. Uh, the Bible talks about those who are living in fear of death because of the devil in the book of Hebrews. But at the same time, there's the other extreme who have a false confidence, a deadly presumption. Uh, no less troubling for those who are in the church but constantly afraid, have no assurance, is the other extreme, those who have a counterfeit assurance. False security. I heard uh, this week on the internet about uh, this mother is suing a, a hospital or her family is suing the hospital because she was taking this medication and showing a great deal of progress that was helping her recover from this illness and then all of a sudden she took a radical turn for the worse and ultimately died. Well, upon investigation they found out that the hospital to save money had bought a resupply of this medication over the internet 
And I don't know, they had gotten it from China and it was virtually watered down to the point where it was almost useless. It was diluted medicine. It was worthless. It was counterfeit. It didn't have the potency. And let's face it, there are a lot of people who go to church and they're taught to have a false assurance and what they've got is a form of godliness but no power. Are there many who say, Lord, Lord, and do not the will of their Father in heaven? And so there's that other extreme of those who've got uh, the false security. You know, I've noticed that uh, Satan has a marketing strategy for the church. The devil, I think, is more pleased to have people in the church. You might be saying, what, Pastor Doug? Satan's idea is to keep everybody away from the church. No, I think what he likes even more, it's almost like he flaunts it before heaven that he gets people in the church with a counterfeit religion. They have the name Christianity, but they're nominal Christians. They're not Christians in heart or in deed. And one way the devil does this is by giving them uh, this... He's got this marketing strategy where he wants to attract people to the church by telling them that you be a Christian and all your problems will go away. You'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. No matter what you do, you're saved. You can't be lost. Uh, and there's just this whole this marketing program that he's got to try to make Christianity look attractive, but it's uh, it's all counter counterfeit. You're not really going through the tribulation. When Jesus comes back, you're going to take all your money and your faith. You'll just be caught up to meet him in the air, get your glorified body, no trouble, no sickness, no problems. And once you're saved, no matter what you do, you can't be lost. That's the extreme. I haven't met too many people, but I have met people that have this really bizarre idea of what Christianity is. Basically, you go through this ritual of saying, yes, I believe in the Lord, and then no matter what you do, God's just going to bless you and you can live for yourself. And they got this assurance, well, it says right here, once I'm saved, I can't be lost. But it's counterfeit. And that's very deadly. That is a deadly presumption. A form of godliness. You know, I, I printed something out, and I don't want to be unkind, but I'm going to be straight. Um, I used to go to Baptist church. I don't know if you knew that. I was a Seventh-day Adventist, but I went to Baptist church. And I went on Sunday because there was no Adventist church uh, for many miles and um, had family and friends that went to the Baptist church and they sometimes asked me to preach. And I said, by all means, I'll be happy to go. So I've got a good understanding. My father was a Baptist. Matter of fact, I was baptized Baptist while I was living up in the cave in the mountains before I was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. So I speak this language. I know of what I speak. And uh, there is not even total agreement within the Baptist community because there are about 20 different branches of the Baptist church. But uh, I printed out something that sort of encapsulates this idea of once you're saved, you can't be lost, and where they draw that. How many of you have heard this before? Once saved, always saved? And they said, how else are you going to have assurance? Now, one reason I'm addressing this is because these concepts have even found their way into uh, other Protestant churches. Once a person is saved, that person is also sealed by the Holy Spirit, in whom you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you have believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's Ephesians 1.13. The word seal, the commentator goes on, means security, a finished transaction. You ask, how long is a person sealed? God's answer is Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed, it's uh, surmising, unto the day of redemption. In Romans 8.23, And not only so, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves we groan within ourselves, waiting for our adoption to, adip, to wit the redemption of our body. So we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the resurrection morning. Does that mean a person who is saved can never be lost? Yes. There is no such thing as the loss of salvation taught in the Bible. I was really impressed with the confidence with which they make that statement. But you know, it doesn't matter how confidently you say a lie, a lie is a lie. And uh, it may seem more convincing if you say it with confidence, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Now let us read John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Now I love these promises. And they are good promises, but they must be understood. No one will take you out of God's hand. Meaning, you cannot be stolen from God. 
And that is absolutely true. But it doesn't mean you can't choose to jump out of His hand. He will not let go of you, but you can let go of Him. Otherwise, what that means is God is holding on to you and you've lost your will. If a saved person cannot be lost, that means God has taken away the greatest gift, which is their choice. They no longer have a choice. The Bible never teaches that we lose our choice when we accept Christ. Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis says the greatest evidence of God's love is the lake of fire because he's giving these objects he loves so much the choice to be lost. Though he doesn't want any to perish, the fact that anyone perishes means that God ultimately respects your choice. You cannot love without a choice. If someone is being forced to follow, it's not love. Isn't that right? And so this idea that once you're saved you can't be lost, really, it takes away your choice and it takes away love. Fourth love is also called rape. God does not drag us into heaven kicking and screaming because I won't let go of Him. That's not what that's meaning. It means you can trust Him not to forsake you, but you are still free. A marriage is a commitment of faith and trust of two individuals, not just one. And our salvation involves two. God's choice and His promise, which never will fail, but it also includes our faith and our trust. Is that right? It's, it goes on here, it gets interesting. It says, I give them an eternal life, they will never perish, no one is able to take them out of my hand. Why do some people teach that when you're saved you can be lost? Because they teach that salvation is dependent on works and not faith alone in Christ. If they're living the life of sin, they never really were saved. Now did you get that? The way they get out of this whole thing of once saved, always saved is saying, well, we realize a lot of people out there are showing that they're not new creatures and they're not living a new life. Well, that just proves they never really were saved. So you know what I've discovered is that Baptists who believe in once saved, always saved have no more assurance than anybody else because if they are floundering or backslidden, the others will point to them and say, I guess they never really were saved. And so how much more assurance do you get with that teaching anyway? Did that make sense? Say amen if that made sense. But does God want us to have assurance? Or does He want us to live in fear? Yeah, He does want us to have assurance. The assurance is trusting in His promises. We must, of course, respond to His promises, but if we are responding to His promises, we can be sure He's going to keep up His bargain. He's made a covenant in blood with you and I. The teaching, once saved, always saved, is... Uh, undermined by the truth. Revelation 2 verse 10 he says, do not fear any of those things you're about to suffer. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison. You'll be tested. You'll have tribulation ten days. Notice what Jesus said to the church. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. How long do we need to be faithful? Just when we make this commitment in the altar at church when we're nine years old? Or be faithful unto death Jesus said, he that endures unto the altar, the end, will be saved. Christianity is not a race that just has a starting line. And that's what once saved, always saved teaches. That race has got a race to run and there is a finish line. We are to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We press on. John 15, 2, notice what Jesus said. Every branch in me, these are the branches that are in Christ, people who are in Christ. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So those who maybe have come to Christ and they're in Christ, but if they have professed Christ and accepted Christ, but if there is no fruit, what does the Bible say? He takes them away. But every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it, does everything he can that it might bear more fruit. Galatians 5 verse 4. He says, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. How can you fall from something you never were at? If you see someone walking down the street, 34th Street, New York City, and uh, they say, you know, I just fell from the top of the Empire State Building. And you say, well, you don't look like you just fell from the top. He says, well, I never was at the top, but I fell from it. How can you fall from the top if you're not there? How can you fall from grace if you are not in a saved situation? You see what Paul is describing, those who had accepted the grace of the Lord, they were in that relationship, but they've fallen from it. 
So is it possible to fall from grace? Was the devil once saved? Yeah. Do you know, the book of Jude tells us the angels which kept not their first estate, they were once saved. They're now in reserved in everlasting chains of darkness. Now they're lost. And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it was saved. Many people don't know that. Abraham saved the people of Sodom and Gomorrah when they had been carried off captive with Lot. They were saved, but they went right back to their sinful lives. Instead of being repentant because of this judgment and rescue, instead of being grateful and changing their ways, they went right back to their evil ways. And even after being saved, they were then lost. Many who were saved from the land of Egypt because of God's grace and the sacrifice of the Lamb, if they refused to believe in the wilderness, they never made it to the promised land. They were saved from Egypt, but they didn't make it to the promised land. They did not enter into the rest because of unbelief. And so the Bible teaches from bow to stern that God is desperate to save everybody. And there's some people who make it part of the way, but they don't make it all the way because they give up. They put their hand to the plow and they look back. Now, Pastor Doug, you're not helping me with my assurance problem. I'll get there. I just want to make sure you don't have false assurance. Because that's like, folks, it's like a security blanket. Some people say, Pastor Doug, just give me a warm, fuzzy security blanket. Something I can, I can suck my thumb and hang on to so that when I'm scared, I don't have to be afraid. I don't want you to have a false security blanket. I want you to, and that's, and a lot of churches have this theology, it's warm and fuzzy, but what they're doing is, they're on the deck of the Titanic and they're walking around with a life preserver that's full of holes. So what good is it going to do them? They're going to jump in the water and think, I don't have to worry, I've got this life jacket. And they're going to drown. Isn't it true that there are going to be a lot of people in the judgment, Jesus said, who are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we're ready now. Where's our reward? Where's our crown? And he's going to say, I don't know you. Oh, but wait a second. Oh, wait a second. I've lived through my Christian experience with assurance. As a matter of fact, I even cast out the, the devils and I taught in your streets and did many wonderful works. And he'll say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. You know what that says? If nothing else, that tells me there are a lot of people who have a false security. Am I right? Isn't that simple theology? A lot of people thought they were saved and they weren't. There are some people who are, think they're saved based on their genetics. I am of the tribe of Israel, so God has to save me. I'm chosen people. That's true. There's some people who think that God saves people based on their DNA. That's not true. Or their race. That's not what the Bible teaches. People are saved based and lost on their heart. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outside. So many have got this false security blanket. You know, I've understood that uh, kids sometimes go around with security blankets and they make them feel good. <laughs> they are sometimes the dirtiest things. Any remember Peanuts on Linus? The thing is just swarming with vermin and bacteria because they won't let mom take it away long enough to wash it. So everywhere they go, they're spreading disease and plague with their security blanket. And some are doing this with this false concept of assurance. They go around because they, it's made them feel so much better, this false theology. They spread it with everybody else to make everyone else feel better. And what they're doing is spreading false security. I want to have assurance, don't you? But I want to have assurance I can be sure of. I want to have assurance that I can stand on. I don't want a lifeboat full of holes when that day comes. I want it to float. Now, it, it probably is a good idea to go through the basics of salvation to understand where do we get our security. As some people have thought that salvation stops with the first step, which is justification. Salvation is composed of justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification, very simply, is illustrated by a beautiful parable where Jesus talks about the publican and the Pharisee who are praying. The Pharisee is reciting all the good works he's done. He pays tithe and everything. The publican doesn't lift up his eyes, but he depends wholly on the mercy of God. And he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He confesses his sin, not his goodness, not his works. His desperate need is his plea. And he's asking for God's mercy. The Bible says, Jesus declared, This man went down to his house justified. He is forgiven solely based on the mercy of God. God looks upon him just as if. 
think about justification, think as God looks at him just as if he had never sinned. Justification is illustrated in this vision in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now there was a high priest in ancient Israel by the name of Joshua. Don't forget the way you say Jesus in Greek. I'm sorry, the way you say Joshua in Greek is Jesus. And the way you say Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua. Yahshua is more precise. Same name as Jesus, this high priest. Standing before the angel of the Lord. That angel of the Lord is sometimes used to describe Christ. And Satan is standing at his right hand to oppose or to accuse him. The way Satan accused Job. And the way that he's called in Revelation the chapter 12, the accuser of our brethren. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Remember what Michael says when, when he comes to get the body of Moses and Satan is there to oppose him. Satan is contesting every soul Jesus saves. He is the accuser. And the Lord said, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? All of us are headed for the fire. By God's grace we are brands plucked from the burning, so to speak. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. He has no right to be saved. His garments are dirty. Symbol of righteousness. And he's standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, this angel of the Lord. Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity, he says to Joshua. And I will clothe you with rich robes. When the prodigal son came home and he's justified by the father, the father accepts him just as he is, doesn't he? And then he says, get the best robe and cover him. You can come to the Lord just like you are. This is a wonderful news of salvation. Anybody, whosoever will, you can come to Jesus. And if you are sorry for your sins, he will give you his royal robe and you are accepted based on his grace. Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put... Um, clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Notice this. If, what's that word? He's given him clean robes. He has nothing to worry about. Now he can do whatever he wants. No. He's been saved by God's grace. If you walk in my ways, and if you keep my command, then you shall judge my house, and likewise you will have charge of my courts, and I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. He's in this heavenly vision. And God is saying to Joshua, the high priest, not only will you, if you minister and you're faithful on earth, and you walk in my ways, I'm going to give you a place to walk with me here. Now he says that to every one of us. Because the high priest interceded for the people. He represented bearing the sins of the people. And Jesus is our high priest who is bearing the sins of the people. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, and you, your companions who sit before you, the, the priests that serve with the high priest. For they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Now who is that? Jesus is that branch that came out of the stem of Jesse, the son of David. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon that stone are seven eyes. Christ is that cornerstone. Revelation talks about the lamb with seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave this inscription, says the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. You don't have to work for it. Justification. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor and his, under his vine and under his fig tree. You'll be in the kingdom. I'm going to save you if you come to me. I'll give you new garments, a new turban. You're forgiven. The accuser of the brethren is rebuked. The devil has nothing against you because you're justified. But then he says, now that you're justified, you must walk in my ways. That leads us to point number two. Sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being sancta. In Spanish, what does santa mean? Holy, right? Santa Biblia. Holy Bible. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy. You are justified when you come just like you are. Sanctified is a process of walking with the Lord and becoming like Him. Jesus accepted the disciples that came to Him. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, it was three and a half years of following Him and they were still learning, Right? 1 Thessalonians 4.3, if you have doubts, lots of scripture. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should be holy. Salvation is not a big cover-up where you're justified and you go on living a sinful life. 
Do you agree? Salvation, you come just like you are, He forgives your sins, but then He transforms you. And it's a process of learning to do good, ceasing to do evil. Luke 18, verse 13. Oh, I already read this one, do you? I'm sorry, um, Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You notice, who are being sanctified. So, if someone says to you, are you saved? What do you say? Well, it depends on what a person's asking you. You know, if, if, uh, if someone's asking you, are you saved? And what they're, it means something different to different people. Some people ask me, are you saved? I say yes. And what they're really saying is, are you a Christian? Right? And the vernacular of Christians, are you saved? Means I've accepted Christ. But in some circles, are you saved means, do you believe that you are saved and you can't be lost? And I, for those people, say, I'm being saved. I'm being sanctified. Second Peter chapter ten, uh, or Second Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a growing process. Ephesians four fifteen. But speaking the truth in love, that you might grow up in all things unto Him who is the head of Christ. Christianity is a growing experience. And I've noticed that if a Christian isn't growing, they're backsliding. You're always dynamic as a Christian, meaning you're moving somewhere. If you are not moving forward, you're backsliding. The termites are getting in. Termites don't get into a mobile home. A motor home, I should say. <laughs> mobile homes park too long. You know, if you're uh, standing still, ants and mosquitoes will get you. You've got to be moving and uh, you stay out of their way. Christian life, sanctification is growth. It's moving. You've got to be reading. You've got to be praying, witnessing, studying. It's a dynamic life. That sanctuary in the wilderness was portable. It was moving. Then you have the final phase of salvation, which is called glorification. And this is an easy one everyone virtually agrees on. That means when we get our glorified bodies and we're in glory. It's where we are, are at the position where we cannot be lost because now we're in the kingdom. When you're glorified, you can say, once saved, always saved. Once you get your glorified body, friends, you have nothing to worry about. The Bible says in Thessalonians, then shall we ever be with the Lord. You can also read there in Romans 8, 17 and 18. If indeed we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be, re shall be revealed in us. This is future. Philippians 3.21 Who will transform our lowly bodies that it might be conformed like unto His glorious body. So that's glorification. When we're in the kingdom, we're in glory, we've got a glorified body. Amen? Justification, sanctification, glorification. Some people, their idea of theology is justification, glorification. They leave out the part where God makes us a saint. The learning process, the transformation, where you become a new creature. There's a change in behavior. Salvation is conditional. God's promises never fail, but you must respond to those promises. God is not the problem. We're the problem. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. Salvation is conditional. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved. Listen to this. The gospel by which you are saved. And some people stop right there. Period. They punctuate. That's the end of the verse. That's not what it says. The gospel by which you are saved if... You listening? If you hold fast to that word which I preach to you. That means it's possible for us not to hold fast. To let go. To give up. To turn back. Again, Matthew 24. He that endures unto the end. 1 John 1, seven. But if... We walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. We can be confident that we are being cleansed from all sin if we hold fast and if we walk in the light. You shouldn't be confident. It is dangerous presumption to be confident if you are not walking in the light. You are trusting in a lifeboat on a plane that is going down in the ocean that is full of holes. You want to know that you are cooperating with the covenant. Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap, if we do not lose heart. There are conditions to the promises. 
There should be evidence, if a person is saved, should there be evidence in the life that they're saved? Is there something different? Once a person is justified and they started trusting their life to the Lord, should there be some difference, an evidence of a change? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. And he went on to illustrate, thistles don't bear grapes and uh, fig trees don't have thorns. He says, you can tell what the tree is based on the fruit. And so it's appropriate to look at the fruit. Someone said one time, if it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it flies like a duck and it swims like a duck, what is it? It's a duck. It's not a vulture. It's not a hummingbird. Uh, sometimes you can look at all the evidence and you know what it is. 1 John 2 verse 29. If you... If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. The new birth is going to be evidence in a person practicing a different kind of life. Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, these are the fruits, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I know uh, they have an expression in, in Texas, they say, That fellow is all hat and no cattle. You ever heard that before? Some people want to look the part of the cowboy and they got the boots with the four inch heels and they can walk bow-legged but they've never ridden a horse and they got the great big ten gallon hat and they got the bolo tie and they got the belt buckle as big as a hubcap and they go strutting around like a cowboy but they've never ridden and they've never roped and they don't own any cows. All hat and no cattle. And there's some Christians like that. All label no fruit. And they like to parade their Christianity, but their, their lives aren't transformed. 1 John 2, verse 3. Now by this we know, can we know? By this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. Jesus is going to say to many lost hypocrites, why do you say unto me, Lord, Lord, and you do not the things that I say? He doesn't want us only to be hearers, but to be doers. Otherwise, we're deceiving our own selves with a deadly presumption and a false assurance. There should be a change in the life. They say, well, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I know I'm saved. Well, they forget He's not only Savior, He's Lord. What does Lord mean? Lord is, well, He's the boss. Lord gives the orders, you obey. Lord is the commander. He's the general. And if you're calling Jesus Lord and you're not obeying Him, you haven't accepted Him as Lord. You maybe want His salvation, but you don't want His kingship. And if you are surrendered to Him and you're willing to take His orders, you can know that you've got eternal life. But if you're living in deliberate disobedience and you still think you're saved, you're self-deluded. It is a deadly presumption it's a false security blanket again by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments he who says I know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him this was our verse but whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him do you want to know would you like assurance then totally surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not only willing for you to be my Savior, I'm willing for you to be my Lord. And mean business with Him. You are the King. You're in charge. You're the boss. You speak, I obey. Then you can know that you're surrendered and you're on His team. But if you're taking your orders from the enemy and you're claiming to be a Christian, you're a traitor. You are a double agent. And you might not even know it. And if that isn't clear enough, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, you want me to talk to you like this? Am I making you uncomfortable? I'm not trying to take away your assurance. Before we're done, I'm hoping that time I want to give you assurance. 1 Corinthians 6 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Doesn't matter if they've gone to the altar and signed a covenant and said a prayer. Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Past tense. 
He saves people from any background. That's good news. All of these kinds of people can be saved. But they were doing those things. They're not anymore. It says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. The whole thing. And then you'll be glorified. In the name of the Lord, by the Spirit of God. You know, there's a quote here. How do you know whose side you're on? How can we know if we're saved? I read this years ago and I never found anything to improve on it. And if you do references, this is from the book, that classic, Steps to Christ. I read it or passages from it frequently. Page 58 and 59, Steps to Christ. It's a chapter called The Test of Discipleship. Bear with me. This is a very important uh, reference, I think. A person might not be able to tell the exact time or place or trace all the chain of circumstances in the process of conversion. But this does not prove him to be unconverted. Christ said to Nicodemus, The wind so blows where it lists, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. John 3, 8. Like the wind which is invisible, yet the effects which are plainly seen and felt, the Spirit of God in His work upon the human heart, it can be seen. That regenerating power that no human eye can see begets a new life in the soul. It creates a new being in the image of God. While the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact. While we cannot do anything to change our hearts or to bring ourselves in harmony with God, while we must not trust to ourselves and our good works, our lives will reveal whether or not the grace of God is dwelling within us. A change will be seen in the character, the habits, the pursuits, the contrast will be clear and decided between what they have been and what they are. The characters revealed, I like this. Pastor Doug, but what, what if I sin? Do Christians ever make mistakes? I'll get to that in a minute. The character is not revealed by the occasional good deeds or bad deeds, but the tendency and the habitual words and actions. It is true there can be an outward correctness of deportment without a renewing spirit or renewing power of Christ. Love of influence and the desire for the esteem of others might produce a well-ordered life. Self-respect might lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. A selfish heart can perform generous actions. By what means then shall we determine whose side we're on? How can we know whether or not we're saved? You ready? If you haven't got it yet. Who has the heart? I've got good theology for that. Lots of scripture for that. Who has the heart? Does the Lord have your heart? With whom are our thoughts? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do you think about? Do you think about Christ? Or do you think about the next video coming out? Are your... Well, I'll let her say it here. Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ, our thoughts are with Him. Our sweetest thoughts are of Him. All we have is consecrated to Him. We long to bear His image, breathe His Spirit, do His will, please Him on all things, because we love Him. It's a, it's a transformation that's motivated by love, not motivated by, oh, I better do this or I'll be lost. I've got to do this so I can get to heaven and don't go to hell. That might be a starting point, but ultimately a Christian wants to be motivated by what? By love. Those who become new creatures in Christ will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. They'll no longer fashion themselves according to the former lusts, but by faith in the Son of God, they'll follow His steps, reflect His character, purify themselves even as He is pure. The things they once hated, they now love. The things they once loved, they now hate. The proud and self-assertive become meek and lowly in heart. The vain and supercellous become serious and unobtrusive. The drunken become sober. The profligate pure. The vain customs and fashions of the world are laid aside. Well, I, I, I could go on. I recommend you read the whole chapter, but I'm going to run out of time. I heard someone describe it this way. You never see a beautiful butterfly eating cabbage. When that butterfly was a worm, the worm might have been eating the cabbage. But once it goes through the metamorphosis, it's looking for flowers. It's not looking for cabbage anymore. And when our hearts have been renewed and we become new creatures, the desires change. You're not looking for stinking cabbage anymore. You're looking for flowers. When you were a worm, you went for the cabbage. But when your heart has changed, and so, if you are still longing for cabbage every day, I'm not talking about health food right now. I'm talking about the, my illustration here. 
I'm talking about worms and butterflies, caterpillars and butterflies. If you're still longing for the things of the world, then what has to happen? Change in the heart. There needs to be a change. You need to go back to square one. Return from where you've fallen. And ask God for that new heart. And with that comes the new desires. A correct understanding of assurance will produce better works. I heard an interesting story. During the uh, construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, during the half, the first half of that project, uh, about 23 men died. Uh, they fell to their deaths. Well, they wanted to do something to repair that, and so they spent $100,000 and they put this very long net under the working area. And 10 more people fell, but they were caught by the net. As a matter of fact, they called them the Halfway to Hell Club. That's what they called them. Because uh, they were on their way down and they got caught by this net. The other thing they noticed that was interesting about this amazing fact is once they put up the net, they got 25% more work out of the workers when they had confidence that they would not perish while working. When we believe we're safe, we work better. Christians who believe they have eternal life and love the Lord do the best works because they're doing them for the right reason. I probably should have started with this definition. What does assurance mean? Just went to the dictionary. The act of assuring. A statement that inspires confidence. A guarantee or a pledge. Freedom from doubt. Certainty. See, confidence. God wants us to have that confidence about our relationship with Him. Now there are a lot of encouraging promises I want to share with you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 For He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You can trust Him. John chapter 6 verse 37 All that the Father gives me that comes to me and all who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Anybody can come to Him no matter what your sins are, no matter what your past is, no matter how long you've lived like a hypocrite with false assurance, you can come to Him and ask for not only justification but sanctification and He'll accept you. And the good news is He'll finish what He started. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. Hebrews 10.22 Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Don't forget that word faith. Hebrews 12 verse 1, I like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us. Do Christians sin? It should not be... Man, I want to find that real quick. Hang on a second. Do Christians sin? Christians do sin. Did anyone hear? Are you surprised by hearing that? What is the difference? I believe the difference is between a Christian and a person in the world, first of all, there ought to be... It's not the occasional good deed or misdeed. Sin should not be the pattern. It's the exception. You got that? The theology going around today is that sin is the pattern for Christians, so don't even worry about it. Don't ever be satisfied with that because sin is what killed Jesus. If you love Jesus, you'll never accept that. For a Christian to say you're indifferent about sin is blasphemous. Sin is the biggest enemy. Sin is what's killing the ones you love. And so for us to not be grieved by sin, that's a sign of bad spiritual health. What is the difference between the Christian who may sin occasionally, and those in the world. Romans 6 verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. He goes on to say in verse 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you. Now in a society where there's peace and harmony, you've got a good king on the throne, there may be an occasional bandit, but they don't reign. You don't want a despot reigning. Sin should not be on the throne in your life. Christ should be on the throne. Are there varying degrees of sin? Yeah. There are sins that are especially offensive. If a Christian, if a fleeting, impure thought goes through their mind and they pause and they cherish that, that's a sin. They should repent and move on. That's not the same thing as committing adultery. 
And I've actually met people before who said, well, the Bible says if you think it in your heart, it's the same as doing it. No, the Bible doesn't say that. There's a big difference. One thing you think it, it's in your mind. You do it, you're involving somebody else and it's an action. One's an attitude. Christ is saying that you've got to take care of the attitude. You'll never have to worry about the action. Big difference. So I think that genuinely converted Christians, when they're growing in sanctification, they're worried about the attitudes. Because the attitudes lead to the actions. What's happened now is the church has fallen so far, we think that we've got the same actions as the world. We're sinning just like the world says, ah, well, it doesn't matter, we're just, you know, we're, Christians aren't perfect, we're just forgiven. That's not true, we're a lot more than just forgiven. There should be a holiness in the life. Now, Numbers chapter, you didn't expect me to go there, did you? Numbers chapter 15, verse 29. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, and then you read on in verse 30, but the person who does anything presumptuously shall be cut off from among his people. Christians who go towards deliberate, presumptuous, high-handed sin, I question their Christianity. Christians may sin unintentionally. Uh, in their attitudes, maybe they're caught off guard even with an action, losing their temper or something like that. But when Christians deliberately sin and grieve the Lord like that, you question if they're really converted yet. They need a new heart. Psalms 19 verse 13, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over there. Didn't Paul just say, let sin not have dominion? And then we read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26, If we sin willfully. Now do you see the Bible's talking about willful, deliberate, presumptuous sin. Christians do not go that way. Do Christians sin? Yeah. We should lay aside the sins and the weights that do so easily ensnare us and run with the termination, that race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. When I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. When Peter walked on water, he did the impossible because he kept his eyes on Jesus. When he took his eyes off Jesus, he sank. When he turned back to Jesus, he did the impossible again and Christ pulled him up. How can you know Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. You cannot lay aside the sin and the weight that besets you and run that race unless you keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. Now I thought I'd summarize with some very important priorities. In the first Corinthians chapter 13, you know what it says? Verse 13, Now abideth the things that stand, faith, hope, love. Faith, hope, love. Those are the keys. Those are the secrets. These three, the greatest of these is love. I want to f wind up here by focusing on faith, hope, love. How can we have assurance? That's the key. Write that down. Right there in that famous passage on love, those are the keys to assurance. Keep the faith is where I'll start. On his many expeditions across Niagara Falls, that famous daredevil, the great Blondin, on one time he actually pushed a wheelbarrow back and forth across Niagara Falls. And he went across, came back to where the crowd was gathered, and he said, um, does anyone here have faith that I could actually push a man across Niagara Falls in this wheelbarrow? The wheelbarrow had no tire, it just had a wheel with a rim that went across the cable. And a lot of people said, yes, we believe you can do it. And then he said, who will get in the wheelbarrow? Nobody raised their hand. And so there's a lot of people who say, I believe that Jesus can save the world from sin. Do you believe He can save you? Well, I'm not getting in that thing. What, I mean, you want me to be a Christian? I mean, really be a Christian? You've got to believe and get in the wheelbarrow. Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God. Faith puts God between us and our circumstances. Look at God. If we look at Goliath, we're going to run like everyone else. David went into battle not looking at the giant or his armor. He looked at the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So if somebody went to the altar in a Baptist church when they were nine years old and said a prayer, but they've lost faith, are they saved? Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Some people lose their faith. Even as Abraham, Galatians 3 verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. He believed. And he was declared righteous. 
1 John 5.13 These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know, you hear that assurance? That you have eternal life and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. You get that? The knowing is sandwiched between two believings. So you want to know? You've got to know sandwiched between faith. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works. John eight twenty four. Therefore I said to you, he will die, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. We've got to believe. Isaiah 7, verse 9. If you will not believe, you will not be established. Faith, hope, love. Let's talk about hope for a minute. Hold on to hope. Sometimes when people say, Pastor Doug, do you know you've got eternal life? Well, there's days I have my doubts, don't you? And the doubts are not ever based on God. They're based on me. <laughs> when I look at me, I say, I don't know how I can be saved. When I look at the Lord, I don't know how I can be lost. But you know what? I don't lose hope. I hope in His salvation. That is the blessed hope. And that's what keeps us going. Psalms 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy. Do you hope in His mercy? He doesn't want you to stop hoping in His mercy. The University of, uh, Duke University did an interesting experiment a number of years ago. They wanted to see how long rats could swim in a container. And so they put this one rat in a bucket, and they did this, I guess, several times to see if it was a trend. And when they put the rat in a situation where he had to swim in a circle and there was no hope, nothing to reach, no way but just swimming, they drowned. They basically stopped swimming and they drowned rather quickly. But then they put another rat in a situation where he was just about able to crawl out, just about able to reach, but they kept the just out of his reach. But as long as he saw hope, he kept swimming until he was physically unable to swim for hours and hours. I know it sounds cruel, doesn't it, that they did this. But what they, they demonstrated that when they had hope, they were able to go much longer. It's like the story I heard about the wizard of a kingdom. He was a sorcerer for a king. And he'd done something to offend the king. And so the king was going to have him executed on this certain day. And on the day of his execution, he said, Your Highness, you're making a terrible mistake executing me because I was planning in the next year on teaching your horse to fly. And you were going to be the most famous monarch in the world because I was going to teach your horse to fly. Well, the king thought about that. And thought, well, and he says, If I don't teach him to fly, you can just kill me at the end of the year. And so the king said, Okay, you got a year king was hoping his horse would fly, you know. Someone asked the wizard later, he says, you really could teach the king's horse to fly? He said, he said, well, you know, in the next year the king might die. So of course, then he said, I could die. So the horse could die. And he says, you never know where the horse might learn to fly. <laughs> so where there's hope, you know. The Bible says for all the living there's hope. First Timothy 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. What is our hope? The Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. And the, finally, love is the key. You know these, but I'm going to repeat them for you. First John 4.10 In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the appropriation for our sins. First John 4.19 we love Him because He first loved us. He loves us first. He justifies us first. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love Me, keep My commandments. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love for us is unchanging. He is love. God is love. Romans 13. For the commandments of God, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet. If there's any other commandment, and he says, I'm not going to name all ten, you know them. They're all summed up in one saying, namely, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm 
to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, if we're lacking assurance, where should the focus be? Faith, hope, love. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You are transformed into the image of the one you behold. You can trust in his promises. Can we have assurance? I believe we can. The assurance isn't based on us, it's based on him. But I don't want you to have a false assurance. If you look at your life and you see that you're walking like a duck and quacking like a duck and flying and swimming like a duck and God is calling you to be a swan, then you need to come back to the cross. Say, Lord, I want to begin with justification. You know the wonderful thing about Christ is that you can have assurance whenever you get off your knees, if you are genuinely sorry for your sins, when you get off your knees, and someone is saying, well, Doug, are you saying that you can be saved and lost and saved and lost? Read your Bible. Did the children of God have a roller coaster experience? Did the apostles sometimes have... Are there ebbs and flows? Are there mountains and valleys in life? People who say, I want assurance that I don't want anything but constant mountaintop. That's just not the way it is because sometimes God tests our faith. Sort of like a person who's on a train and you know you're going the right direction. You might go through a tunnel, but as long as that train is moving, you don't worry, right? You don't see where you are. You can't see the landscape. You don't know where you're going. It's dark in the tunnel, but you can hear and feel the train is still moving in the same direction you started out on. Christian life is something like that. You can know you're going the right direction. You can have that assurance. But I want you to have real assurance, friends. That's based on the promises of God and you're following His conditions. Let's pray that we can have that real assurance. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the promises in Your Word that You are the author and finisher of our faith that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you will not let us go, that all who come to you will be received. Help us, Lord, choose to keep our hand in your hand. I pray that you'll be with any person here who's been struggling with doubts. Help them to know that they can come to Christ right now. All of their sins can be washed away. They can go down to their house justified based on your grace and mercy. Then, Lord, I pray that you will give them the Spirit and because of love for you, they will go through that metamorphosis, have a new heart, and turn from caterpillar to butterfly. Their desires will be changed. They'll long to serve you. They'll have sanctification. Bless us that we might all have that experience, Lord, to be transformed into your image. Be with this church. Be with the families represented here. Save us, Lord. And as we go from this place, I pray that we can have that right balance of assurance and confidence, and yet also the caution of not being foolish and turning back. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your promises. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.